So in case you guys didn't catch it earlier, my name is Chris Steffen. I'm a Rubyist and a Cobo developer. I'm actually not a normal DevOps person, even though it may seem that way from at least my last talk and today's talk. But I'm going to do my best to uh, try and impress you guys. Uh, I work for Squaremouth in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and today, tonight I'd like to talk about Docker. Uh, but before I tell you all about Docker, I want to tell you a little bit about some of the underlying technologies that make Docker work. So to start with that, I need to take a bit of a detour and define some of the key pieces that uh, make up Docker. And to start with, they all come from the Linux kernel. So if you're familiar at all with that concept of the Linux kernel, it's this big monolithic crazy thing written by Linus Torvalds and a bunch of other people uh, where there's a lot of open source code. Uh, the first piece of open source code that is used in the Linux kernel for Docker is uh, what's called C groups. Another word for this, or what you could also call it, is control groups. And control groups are collections of processes bound by a certain specific criteria that could be something as simple as a file system, uh, a processor, uh, memory, or uh, networking. Um, and C groups end up becoming nice, crazy tree hierarchies where you can have C groups belong to another C group. Uh, the second key technology that makes up Docker is uh, namespace. And it works exactly like you think it would. Um, it is used to isolate different groups of processes in such a way that particular stuff in a namespace cannot see anything outside of its own namespace. But anything above that namespace can see down into it and see all the processes that are running in it. Uh, between C groups and namespaces, the end result is probably the most important technology, which is uh, Linux container, also known as the LXC. So now the question becomes, what is Docker? Well, Docker is actually made up of LXC, C groups, and namespaces. So now that we kind of know what the pieces are and what it's made up of, we can dive a bit deeper into exactly what it is. Uh, so the, the awesome thing about Docker is that it's actually, uh, it inherits some of this nice isolation from C groups and namespaces. So our Linux containers are completely isolated from one another. So anything running in a particular container uh, can't see what's happening in any other container right next to it. So we can have these kind of sandboxes where anything can happen, like you could RMRF root and it'd be okay because the rest of the system will keep running even though we just did something really terrible. Uh, and Docker also has this crazy concept they like to call images. And an image is basically the file system changes necessary to describe a particular container. So if I were to install MySQL on a machine and install, say, a couple other packages like Git, Vim, curl and other, other pieces of, of what I'm going to use, all of those changes that happen to the file system would get saved off into an image. And we can think of these images as uh, layers of how we're going to build our container. So uh, Docker has this really nice feature that you can basically stack image on image. So you build these layers of, I've installed these couple tiny services, and I'm going to use this layer to build another layer. And it gets kind of crazy, but what ends up happening is that you start off with, say, a base Ubuntu box that has absolutely nothing on it other than the core Ubuntu defaults. You'd install some of your standard stuff like curl, git, vim, wget, some of the things I mentioned earlier, and that'd be your base image that you'd start everything with. And then you'd say, well, man, I really got to run uh, some Ruby code. So now I'm going to create a Ruby layer, and I'm going to base my Ruby layer on top of all of the changes I made inside of the Ubuntu layer. So then you create your Ruby layer by installing Ruby, either from the package manager, compiling it, you know, however you're going to do it, RVM. And then you'd say, man, now I really need to run a Rails app. So you'd say, well, where do I need to do that? Well, I'm going to start with my Ubuntu box, which also has my Ruby. And then I'm going to say, let's install Rails. So I install all the pieces that I need. So this is our third layer, our Rails app. And now we have a container that's ready to go and run our Rails app. Uh, and now it's time for some code. So I'm going to show you what I've kind of just talked about. This is the this is the actual like how it works. Let's let's run some command line stuff and see what happens. Good intro to Strapian, though. That's great. Thank you. <laughs> what is that from? You know, I don't know. A coworker gave me that, and I thought it was really cool looking. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. You know. Can you guys read that okay? Uh, 
little bit more, please. Way bigger. Yay, nay. Just for good measure. <laughs> okay, so uh, if you guys were familiar with my talk last month, I talked a little bit about Chef and one of the key pieces of technology that was involved in that is uh, Vagrant. I am a big fan of Vagrant. Vagrant is really awesome. It allows me to run virtual machines and describe them with a uh, just a plain Ruby file. So I can write all the Ruby code that I normally would in, in a regular app to kind of describe my VM, my ideal VM, where all the pieces come from, where the image comes from, uh, how I set it up with the network and things like that. So I'm going to start with the uh, Vagrant file I've set up for running Docker. Uh, the, the reason is, is that Docker actually will not run on my Mac natively because my Mac is not doesn't have a Linux kernel. So I need a Linux layer to start with so I can start building these containers. So I'm going to set up a virtual machine. Uh, it just so happens that Google, as awesome as they are, has built uh, Chrome OS, which they basically took and distilled down into the most absolute bare bones, tiniest, barely it's the Linux kernel and that's it, uh, operating system that they like to call Core OS. So I've decided to base my uh, Linux layer on Core OS. So you'll see up here that I'm going to call it my Core OS Alpha Box. And this is actually where I'm going to download the box from. Uh, some of the details, if I was using VMware Fusion to run my virtual machine, uh, this is what's going to actually configure it for there. But I'm actually going to use VirtualBox to do so. So we jump on down. Uh, there's a lot of code here, so don't get hung up on all the crazy details. I just wanted to give you a feel for what this file has in it. Uh, one of the key pieces is I'm going to set up my own little private network on my laptop so that my uh, CoreOS machine has its own IP address that I can talk to. And then I'm also going to set up NFS so I can share files between my laptop and this virtual machine. Uh, so this, did this start, was this born as a recipe or did you, what is this as original code versus like a tailored recipe? So the majority of this file actually came from the core OS project on GitHub. So I've uh, cargo culted as much of it as I could because they have some pretty good stuff. And I kind of tailored very small pieces of it to my needs. And I'll have links at the end so you guys can pull down this repository. Uh, some of the other pieces that are involved in Docker, uh, we're going to actually use what's called a Docker file to kind of describe the recipe for how we're going to build our images. So we'll start with what I described as our base uh, image that is based off of Ubuntu. So you can see up at the very top, really simple syntax. I'm going to start with Ubuntu 12.04. I'm the maintainer of the package, which this seems very trivial, but this is actually kind of important. This helps. Uh, Later on, we'll find out with caching. Um, and then it's just basically uh, shell commands. So when I want to start installing some of the basic stuff that I'm going to put in this container, uh, I just run apt-get to install the pieces that I need. Uh, the majority of these things are just kind of prerequisites for other stuff that I'm going to install later in other images. So we want to make sure that we have the bare necessities in order to have a, a well-rounded, this could be used anywhere image. The last thing I'm going to do in here is uh, create a directory so that uh, for SSH, uh, the daemon, so that we can actually sign into these containers by SSH and kind of poke around and look and see what's happening. Uh, so I'm actually going to build our first container. Can I ask a question? Yeah, go for it. If you expose the 422, why not 80? Why 422? So 22 is going to be for SSH. Okay. Is that the standard port for SSH? Okay. So in order to build our first container, we're going to use the Docker command line uh, application. This is actually installed on my local Mac, but what's going to happen is it's going to talk to the VM that I've set up, and it's going to send the commands using the Docker CLI to talk to my VM and, and issue commands to it. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to build out that container, and all it's going to really do is run this Docker file. So I go ahead and run uh, the build command, and I'm going to give it uh, tag, so like we're going to call it Docker Playground base, and the folder where I'm storing everything is in the base folder. So I go ahead and run that. It's done. So quick and short of it is I've actually pre-built all of these containers so that you guys don't have to sit and wait for app to get to run and install the packages. But the nice thing to note here is that because I've already built it, this container is ready to go. I didn't have to wait and sit around, so you only pay the price of installing all of these pieces once, which is awesome. 
So when you start to try and iterate and reinstall things and change things around, you only ever have to start from where you started changing things. So I don't have to sit around and wait for build, build essential to install or for app get update to run, which can take some time, especially if you have a slow internet connection. And are, you, are you saying like if I change step three there, one and two would be like instant, and then three it just continue with everything? Absolutely. Okay. Actually, and we'll go ahead and do that real quick. So let's say we want to actually install some more stuff. So we'll do a run command and say we want to install. I don't know. Anybody have a package they want? NCP. 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 PHP five. ICP. PHP. Something that's gonna run fast. They don't run fast. Uh, and the, okay, okay, well, so PHP 5 is the package name. Is that? Oh, no, terribly. Don't do that. <laughs> I mean, that well, might, I might have a lot of eight different ones. That might be glass for me in a Ruby meetup, so I'll, we'll stick with NTP. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was good. No, the real bad part is that it's a meta package. It's going to install. Yeah. Yeah. Right, yeah. right, right, right. So, sorry if the first part of this was very dry. I promise it gets more exciting as we start changing stuff. I'll start heckling it for a while. Yeah. Go for it. <laughs> So right now it went and ran it, it ran all of the steps that we've already built at that point, ready to go, it pulled them from a cache so that we don't have to do them again. And right now we're installing uh, NTP and it looks like, uh, no, we're good. Depending on the internet here, it may be really fast or maybe really slow. I thought it was small. Well, I think we've established at this point it's not really fast. Well, this is core OS, so they yeah. <laughs> It's really insanely fast. So it looks like NTP did not work. So maybe we try uh, uh, NTP, NTPD, NTPD, NP, NT, NTPD, uh, the daemon, noon. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Like neuter, uh, <laughs> November Tango Papa, uh, November Tango Papa Delta. There you go. Nope. Well, I'm just like, no, 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 wait. I, I'm sorry. I totally lied. That totally worked. <laughs> so we'll go ahead and put that back. Okay, so now we've built our base image. And an image is just a collection of all of the things that we've done up until this point. It's nothing more, nothing less. And the, like I said, the nice, really nice thing is that it caches every step of the way, so we only have to pay the price of installing stuff and configuring things where we change. So if I start adding to the bottom, like if I go down here and do another app get install, let's say we try and install the same package. We only have to wait for it to tell me that, look, it's already installed. Or that it can't find the package. One or the other. Okay. So that's our base image. And what I'm going to do is undo that so that we don't have to wait for the other ones. Right. Okay, so we have our base image. Now, uh, going back to my example from earlier, we want to run a Rails app in Docker uh, as a container. So the next thing we need to do is we need to install Rails. Uh, so let's go ahead, oh, well, Ruby. Let's try that way. So we run to my Ruby Docker file, and I personally like RBM. Uh, there could be other people in the room that like RBM or CHRuby or any of the other ways to install it. Or if you're really crazy, you want to install it from the package manager or from source, go for it. Sorry. I'm not being a troll at all. I really do have a question. Go uh, for it. Did it go instantly because it already had that cache when you backspace stuff? Like, yeah. And if you had installed something and then you changed up the configuration, would it take care of getting that out of the system for you? Absolutely. All right. Yeah. It'll take care of everything. It's right. wonderful. It'll even do your laundry if you're really nice to it. <laughs> not my wife. She'll love it. Okay. So now the trick to this file is that we're going to start from our base box. So we're no longer starting from Ubuntu 1204. We're going to start from that base image that we created a step previously. Again, this seems really trivial and silly, but this actually has to do with caching. The maintainer line is very important. If I change this line, it would have to redo everything below it. So we're not going to do that. Uh, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to install some of the dependencies that Ruby needs to compile. Yeah, go for it. How does it handle package versions? The new version of will SSL comes out, will it, when you run that command, will it get the latest? So the or trick. Do you want to do like you do a gem file and say I want to peg it to this version of this, this version of that. So the, the trick is, is when you run this and it builds off its cache, is it takes the exact version of like say live SSL at that time. So you want to rebuild your image as fresh 
like by hard, like remove the image completely and start fresh. If you wanted the newest version of, say, Live SSL, you worry about hard boot or something along those lines. Okay. Like, like on your base, you want to do the update, and then oh. from there, uh, as long as that's re recently refreshed, you can grab it That's exactly it. So we'll ignore some of these packages because they're kind of silly, but we need them in order to install uh, Ruby and build it from source. So the next couple things I'm doing is I'm actually cloning down RBN from GitHub. Uh, GitHub, try that again. And we're gonna also install uh, Ruby build so we can actually compile Ruby. Uh, the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna set up some environment variables. And the nice thing is, is this environment variable will run for the rest of any other layer that uh, is based off of this layer. So we can set environment variables, like modifier path in a particular layer, and every other layer that's based off of that will inherit that uh, environment variable we've set up. And then the last thing I'm doing is making sure that RBM is going to work. So we'll go ahead and install uh, Ruby 2.1, and then uh, make sure that we set that as our default. And if you're familiar with RBM, we want to make sure we rehash so that all the gems that we just installed are available and ready to go. So we'll go ahead and run uh, a build for that container. We have a question back right here, I think. Yeah, go for it. Language and DSL of anything? The run, expose? So it's just part of the Docker file. Uh, the, the underlying underpinnings of it all is Golang. Um, okay. But there's basically all of maybe 10 very specific words that you can use in those files. It's just 15. 15? Yeah, that's it. 15. OK. He's got, he's got my back back there. <laughs> So if I can't answer it, you guys ask that guy. <laughs> uh, so let's go ahead and build that. Uh, let's make sure I actually get the right command. OK, so again, the cache is already there. So we didn't have to wait half an hour, 45 minutes for Ruby to compile. It's ready to go. Uh, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and create another layer, and we're going to create an image for <coughs> Rails itself. Now, this one's a bit trickier. I kind of want to go through a little bit of the pieces. Um, and our eventual goal is to basically have a brand new Rails app that I've started from scratch using the Rails new command running in our container. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to do, again, is I'm going to start with our Ruby layer so that we have Ruby installed and Ruby available. Uh, we're going to go ahead and drop in uh, Rails gem. And again, we're going to do rehash so that all of the gems that got installed when we installed Rails are available. Um, we're going to create our new Rails app. Uh, and then it turns out there are a couple more dependencies that we need very specifically for Rails. We need a JavaScript runtime. And we're going to talk to a MySQL database. So we need the MySQL uh, headers installed. Uh, so here's where you get really creative and your, your neck beard really starts to show. Is uh, <laughs> yeah. When you need to change default things like the gem file, because we're not going to use SQLite and we're going to use MySQL, you get crazy Unix foo and you start using sed to replace pieces of the file so that you're ready to go. You could normally just drop off the correct file. Yeah. You can pass a flag to Rails new to tell if you use MySQL. Good call. Yeah, but that, that ruins the whole set. Yeah, my bad. So <laughs> let the neckbeard flow. No, you just That's shave okay. that neckbeard off. It's just all gone. <laughs> So, although I could have passed a flag to Rails to make sure that it used MySQL, I instead opted to use sed because I really like sed. And I, I'm a big fan of regexes. So we'll go ahead and we're going to swap out SQLite and use MySQL 2 instead. And then one of the nice pieces of this, and part of the new thing that I'm doing in this, is I'm adding a very particular, a very specific file into the container. Uh, so the, the keyword for this is add. And it's just a file inside of my Rails folder over here. So we can jump over there, and you can see it's very simple. It is just a very small, typical database YAML with just the development environment set up. The only trick to it is I'm using environment variables to show the host and the port. So we, we haven't gotten to MySQL yet, but we'll get there. The trick is that they have to be in the environment. So we're going to jump back into our Docker file. Uh, the next part is we're going to actually run a shell script to start Rails for us. We'll jump into that. Uh, we're actually adding it first. So very simple. We're going to jump into the new directory we created, make sure our database is created, and run Rails server. Okay. Make sure our script is executable. 
and then we're going to make sure that all of the gems that are included in our gem file after we've kind of mucked with it are installed and good to go. And then the, the second to last portion is we're going to make sure that because Rails defaults to port 3000, we want to make sure that that container has that port available so we can talk to it. And then the last part that is very new is we're going to run a command. Uh, the idea behind Docker is that each container runs exactly one process. You can get around that and be really crazy about it, but typically you start exactly one process. That process could in fact be something like supervisor D that then spawns off like five of the processes, but the idea behind it is you start one thing, and in our case it's going to be the Rails uh, web app. Go ahead. Can you have variables inside this file? Kind of. You can use environment variables from your current uh, machine. Okay. So it has a very, very, very limited syntax to do exactly what you need it to do. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and build our last container. And again, it was very fast because it was all cached. We didn't have to wait for Rails to install all the gems and things like that. Uh, and we didn't have to wait for uh, any other pieces that we did in that script. So now that we've built all these images, the boring part, we got all that out of the way, we can actually start up uh, some of the containers that we've created. But the first thing we want to do is, so let's pretend for a second, I don't know how to install MySQL, and I don't want to write a Docker, uh, Docker file to do it. So the trick to it is, I can actually go to uh, the Docker index and find somebody else who's done it for me. Because personally, I don't want to take the time to figure out MySQL. So we're just going to find somebody else who's smarter than me, who's already done it for us. So we jump to the Docker index, and it, is this all readable? Yeah. I've decided that I personally like the Docker files that uh, this company, Orchard, writes. So I'm going to grab theirs, and I'm looking at it, and I'm like, yeah, it sounds like exactly what I need. Okay, so do they have a GitHub page? Of course they do. I can look at their GitHub page. That's great. I know which one I want to use, so I'm going to actually use a command to pull in their Docker file from the Docker index. So I'm going to say pull, and it looks like theirs is uh, orchard up slash mysql. So we'll go ahead and pull that in. And this will actually pull all of the layers that they've created on their machines ready to go down onto my machine. And it looks like theirs is actually comprised of quite a few layers in order to actually install mysql and have all the pieces we need. But the nice thing is, I don't have to care. It's already built. It's just like Ruby Gems or NPM. It's ready to go. It's ready to rock and roll. Uh, so what we're going to actually do now is we're going to start our first container. Uh, and I'm going to cheat and steal it from my readme so I know what command to run. And the nice thing is, back to the question you had earlier, is how do we pass in variables in the environment? So by creating an environment variable as part of this command, I can set our password. And I'm just going to set it to nothing, because that's good enough for me. Uh, and we have started our first Docker container. This that's, is really secure, by the way. That's why he's not the DevOps guy. <laughs> <laughs> we don't need passwords. OK, so now we have a container running. And it gave me this really big, long, gibberish string. I'm like, okay, well, what happened, right? So Docker, this, the command line interface, comes with this really nice command that kind of matches some other Unixy tools, and it's just Docker PS, and that will tell us all of the different containers we already have running at this point. So yeah, looking at the format, uh, you can see that I'm running a container named uh, orchard underscore MySQL, and it is exposing uh, port... 49186 on my machine as port 3306 inside of the container. So something really awesome just happened here. MySQL actually normally runs on port 3306, and we can use that to our advantage in, in this container world. We can let the container think that MySQL is going to keep responding <coughs> to port 3306, but in reality, our local my dev machine is going to be actually talking to it on port 4, 000, or 49186. So we can actually use things that, like, say I really wanted to run something else that runs on 3306. I can run it inside of a container, and it doesn't matter. 
is that the, the port on my machine I'm going to use to talk to it is going to be totally different. So now that we have MySQL running, we'll go ahead and start uh, our Rails container. Quick question, if you just uh, NC uh, that port, you would see MySQL? Mm -hmm. Hello? NC netcat, right? Yeah. Is there any particular syntax I need other than this or uh -huh. any flags or anything? Uh, Maybe space for the port. I'm going to trust you on this one. If we're wrong, man, it's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> what was the port I said it was on? Anybody remember? We're going to guess. Yep. And he is right. It is my sequel there. That's cool. Yes. Uh, okay, so now we're going to go ahead and start our uh, other container. So there's a little bit of explanation that needs to be said about this particular command. There's a lot of options I'm throwing in to make sure it runs correctly. And these are the types of things that you throw in a readme, like I've done over here, so that you don't forget, because there's too much to remember. Uh, the first is that we're going to actually link our first container, our MySQL container that I've created, into our uh, Rails app container that I'm about to create. And what that ends up actually doing underneath the covers is setting environment variables with all of the ports that we've exposed in MySQL inside of our new container. The benefit of that is, is that our new container can just read those environment variables to figure out how to talk to MySQL, uh, which kind of lends itself back to the set we were using earlier and the environment variables we were pulling out. Uh, the next part is that uh, we're going to actually expose all of the ports uh, automatically. We're going to publish them all that are part of the Docker file. And if we jump back to our Docker file for the Rails app, it looks like the only thing we're exposing at this point is 3,000. But if you also remember, it's built on layers. We go back a couple layers. We're also exposing port, exposing port 22. Uh, we're going to give it a name so we can talk about that particular container. And we're going to tell it what image to be based off of, which in this case, I've named our image playground slash rails. So I'll go ahead and start it up. And it looks like it's complaining because I've already created this. Let's go ahead and kill that. But don't forget you gotta you gotta rename the the database over again when you do it a second time. So when you link them together again a second time, you have to rename the database. So essentially it would be orchard up MySQL and then I just do like underscore two and then it just renames it over and over again. Normally it takes a second, it like just lets you add additional names to it, like you can add as many names as you want to a container. Yeah, that's why I said I just put underscore and then I just add, you know, like a two or a, whatever. You know, you can so where do you, where do you add that at? Right after, um, right before the, yeah, right before that. Just put under, I just put, you know, whatever. You can name it, you know, uh, underscore beer, whatever, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Complaining about the rails yeah, right. It's gonna do a thing. I feel like it's gonna do a thing. Actually, so here's so here's the trick. So it actually started. I, I I missed one nice little flag, and again, this is why you copy from a readme instead of doing like I'm doing right now. I missed the dash D. 
so that it didn't actually attach to the output. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Detachable right here. Yes. So now we've actually started, minus the little bit of trouble there, we've actually started our second container. So now if we use Docker PS to see what's running, we can see that we actually have two containers running at this point. We have our Rails app, and we also have our MySQL uh, database. And the coolest part of this all is if I use curl, like a boss, to grab the... Uh, did you say like a boss? I did, yes. <laughs> you slid in on like a boss. <laughs> <laughs> if we use curl like a boss to figure out uh, what's going on with our Rails app, it's going to send back what I'm promising you is in fact the Rails landing page. But in case you don't believe me, we'll go ahead and actually pull it up on my machine. Not like a boss. Not like a yeah. boss, no. Unlike a boss. 49192. Good call. And this is, in fact, our Ruby on Rails default app. So, yes, that was the end of my demo. I have a little bit more going, but thank you for the enthusiasm. <laughs> So that was building two different containers. We built a couple different layers to make those containers. We hooked the two containers up in such a way that now if we think about this in the real world, if this was actually our production environment, if I only had a MySQL database on Amazon and a Rails like a application server hanging out on Amazon, I have just replicated the entire production infrastructure in imaginary land on my own laptop. And the nice thing is, is I didn't have to have a virtual machine for each one of these things. So we'll jump back to... So I'm going to push it to the register. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You've gone too far. I'm sorry. My bad, my bad. So when you did the RM commands, you were RMing Rails app, that was a container that was running that you were killing? I was deleting a container, yes. Not only stopping it, but then also deleting it. Okay. Now there's a box people. Something totally different. Okay. So now that you've seen what Docker looks like, I want to kind of talk about what it actually looked like, what life existed like before Docker, when people actually wanted to replicate their entire production environment across all of the nodes that they have. Uh, the first thing that people would do is they'd actually build out their exact same production environment, say they're using Amazon, across all of the different nodes that they set up in a production environment. That gets really costly really fast. Say you have 10 different servers that you're running and they're all not micro instances on Amazon, it gets really costly really fast. Uh, the second thing you could possibly do that most people would do is they'd be like, well, let's just start virtualizing it. But if I, again, if I have 10 servers, say I have two database servers, uh, three Mongo servers, two Memcache servers, a couple app servers, and then maybe a load balancer to top it all off, I don't think I can run that all on my own machine if each one had its own virtual machine. I'd just run out of resources really fast. Uh, the last thing you could do, the kind of the Hail Mary, the last ditch effort, is you start scrounging and looking for all of the paying fours you have hanging out in your closet. Maybe go to your friends, your neighbors, and be like, hey, come on, I really need your computer. And you start building out your hodgepodge network to be like, man, this is production, but in my closet. <laughs> <laughs> so that didn't work either, oh, right? Okay. <laughs> so none of those options seemed very viable to me, so Docker was definitely a solution for me. Uh, the question now becomes, where does Docker, the, the cool stuff that I did earlier in the command line, where does that fit into a developer's normal workflow? Uh, as I've said before, and I'll repeat again and again, is that it allows me to perfectly mirror our production environment on my own local machine, and I'm not as worried about resources because at the end of the day, it takes running all of the exact services, not a virtual machine per service. So all I need is enough RAM and processor to run a couple of MySQL servers, a couple of Mongo servers, maybe a memcache server, a load balancer, and some app servers, which isn't as bad unless you start virtualizing it. Uh, the next thing is that uh, the really awesome thing is now we can run our tests. Instead of me running all of my spec tests and my integration tests for our awesome cool Rails app on my own machine, I can run it on uh, a mirror of our production environment. The nice thing is, since I'm personally deploying to uh, Linux and the cloud, I now know that the tests that I'm writing that are passing in my containers are the same tests that would essentially pass in a production environment. I don't have to guess that, well, there's this kind of weird difference between my laptop and production that I just kind of have to have hope that my tests cover. It doesn't matter. Now I have this exact mirror, so I don't have to worry about that. 
the, the last thing, and probably one of the most important things, especially because of the caching layers, is that I can test changes to my app quickly. If we know that Ruby 2.2 is coming out in a month, and we really want to test the next build of Ruby against our app, I can fire up a new uh, container that's using our new version of Ruby, use all of the rest of the existing containers, and run all of my tests and know that everything's still passing and that, man, this upgrade to Ruby 2.2 isn't going to kill me. Right? So I don't have to actually do it in production and be like, oh shit, where's the rollback button? Uh, another question that I asked a lot is, why Docker? Uh, more specifically, why not just use the plain vanilla LXCs? Um, and I can appreciate running just plain vanilla LXCs. There's a lot less uh, uh, pomp and circumstance to it. I don't have to create a lot of files. I just start containers up, do what I need to in the container, and call it a day. But I think people who do that and don't use Docker are missing out on one of the biggest things that Docker brings to the table. And as you saw earlier, is the caching. It's insanely fast. I don't have to pay the cost of installing uh, Rails or Ruby every single time I want to do something. I can just fire up containers that already have it ready to go. Right? That's that's awesome. I don't have to wait for it. Another thing that you saw me use was the public index. I don't have to be the DevOps genius that uh, people want me to be, and I can just be like, well, somebody else has a better idea than I do. So I can go and pull down their image and say I really like what they're doing, but there's a couple of tiny little things that I want to tweak. I can take their image, pull it down, build my own, base it on theirs, and add those tiny little layers on top. So I'm not tied down to exactly the way they set things up. Um, something else that's really great about Docker is the documentation. Uh, I know it's actually officially not a 1.0 release. They, they swear up and down, don't use it in production. You hear all sorts of people saying, it's not ready yet, it's not ready yet. But you look at their documentation, and I'll tell you right now that I am not confused. Like normally I look at most documentation and it's like I don't even know what I'm looking at, where to start, what I'm doing. I look at Docker's documentation, everything is very, very clearly laid out. And as he pointed out earlier, there's exactly 15 keywords for a Docker file. Like that's tiny, that's tinier than any programming language. Uh, so it's, it's very, very easy to consume and uh, Docker, the company, makes that very easy with their documentation. The last and most important piece outside of caching is uh, it's open source, and not only is it open source, but it's written in Golang. I don't know about anybody else in the room here, but I'm personally not a uh, kernel junkie, and I'm not the C guru that most people need to be in order to contribute to the kernel. So instead, if I want to contribute to Docker, I don't need to know C, I don't need to know how the kernel works, I just need to write Golang, which is a lot higher than, say, a kernel development. So if I feel like there's this awesome feature that Docker really needs to have, I can contribute that using Golang versus hoping that Linus decides to give it to us in the kernel. Uh, are there any questions? Who's kind of maintaining the, the Docker project? Like so the, the, the Docker project is being maintained by the company now currently known as Docker, formerly as uh, whatever the name was. Is it Basecamp? <laughs> yeah, they used to be DocCloud. No, it's Basecamp, I'm pretty sure. It's Basecamp. <laughs> or 37 Signals, maybe. Yeah, no, it's not cloud. Yeah, you in the back. Uh, have you, with using CoreOS, have you done much with the auto discovery and SCD uh, using containers? You know, I have kind of just toying around. Uh, uh, it, it's nice, it's awesome, it reminds me of Redis to a point. Yeah. But because I'm not pushing anything out into a production environment where my containers have to kind of like realize and like be self aware of all the other nodes, it has never been like a man, I really need to know how this works. Mm -hmm. Seems pretty slow. Right? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah. just in the VM that I haven't done that much otherwise. Yeah, it seems like the replacement is salt, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I don't have to use salt anymore. It's all all of this code. Any other questions? How big a, uh, I guess, what's the file size once like, the image is actually compiled? Yeah, I can show you that. So, If you look at it here, as it always here, yeah, oh, you know, no, no, it's not telling me there. It's actually when you build the images. There we go. So those yeah, are not the screen share. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I'm on this. Good call. Box people are cool though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
vandalizing the anxious house. <laughs> Is that better? We good? See, Do I actually have oh, there? No. So much better. Okay. So uh, the virtual size of these, as, as if they were real things, is is quite large. But if we actually look at the size of the container or the the virtual machine itself, so if I go ahead and Actually. Okay, it's not that small, I promise. <laughs> I've just invented this new compression oven. I'm telling you, it's great. I'm not selling it to Cooley or anything. Okay, so the uh, .vmdk is the virtual disk, and that's all of 382 megs for the entire thing. That's all of the images I built, all of the intermediate layers that I built, all of the things I pulled in from the Docker index, core OS itself, all of the containers that are actually running with their own file systems. So it is still pretty impressive. Any other? Are the containers read only? Or do they... So they are not. Uh, one of the things that I kind of glossed over I'm glad you asked that, is that uh, because we have this awesome, uh, because I set up NFS, I can share stuff from my machine into a container, and any files that get written into a container will exist forever until I destroy that container. So if I go in there and create a container and just start monkeying around and creating hundreds and hundreds of text files, they will exist up until I destroy that container. And I can start and stop that container at will, and all of those files will continue to persist. So how would you, uh, where would your MySQL store? So the MySQL, the data for that container right now is actually inside of the container. Uh, say we actually wanted to persist it across multiple containers, I would then set up uh, in such a way that my container would read from an NFS share on my machine with the actual data that I wanted to share across like say 10 containers. So I could run 10 MySQL instances off of the exact same data. Or, I'm oh, sorry. I was just going to say in that Vagrant file that you showed up, it has a line where you can comment in or out whether or not you want to share um, with VirtualBox. So you can use it at your discretion. And it'll, it'll ask you for administrative privileges and then you can go back and forth. Like you just said, you can go back and forth with shared files between your local machine and then the container itself. And that would be part, that would be this right here. Yeah, so ignoring all the crazy syntax, all it's really saying is I'd like to share a folder that I've conveniently named data off here to the left. Uh, and inside of uh, my core OS machine, my virtual machine, it's going to be mapped to slash home core share. So if I were to actually sign into the core OS box and say, I, oh, you know what? <laughs> I'm kind of cheating a little bit. I'm actually running the container from somewhere else. I can't show you that. It's actually running from somewhere else, so sorry about that. Go for so it. So obviously it's not 1.0, so it's not kosher for production, but is anybody actually pushing in production? How are you deploying in production? What's it look like? To tell you the truth, I'm, I'm almost 100% certain that people are pushing into production, only because that's the way things go. Right. Like beta, alpha stuff gets pushed to production all the time. Is it Mailchimp? Well, is it, is it Mailchimp? Yeah. I know there is, is either Mailchimp or... It's one of them that's using it. It's, it's, a, it's an over 60 euro company, like Mail. I think the name of it is Mailchimp. I think they're using it. Yeah, there are tools around running, I mean, because you're going to want many Docker instances, many servers. Are there tools that handle this yet? So there are. There, there's, there's a lot of people competing to be like the tool to kind of wrap around Docker. Because not any one of them yet has stood out among the crowd, I haven't really invested any time because I hate to pick the wrong tool and learn something totally pointless that ends up being deprecated tomorrow. But I do know there are tools around where you can kind of use YAML files to describe your infrastructure and it would build out containers based off of images and things like that. OpenStack's creating a lot of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Red Hat is really trying that. Yeah, Red Hat yeah. with their open, is it OpenShift or something like yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I use OpenShift a lot with Docker. They're, they're trying to capture kind of, I guess you want to call it the Docker cloud game. Um, and they're kind of at the forefront of it because so many people trust the Red Hat name. Um, but other for like the, like the repository he used for Orchard Up, so Orchard Up and Fig 
it's a company that's kind of coming, you know, and they're kind of they're kind of the so you know open, if you look at Open Shift and Red Hat is at the top, or Orchard Up and Fig is kind of at the bottom. They're kind of you know the guys in the garage that say, hey, look, you know, we can jump in this game too. So instead of using like Vagrant Up, he would use Orchard Up mm -hmm. to push up his his Docker uh, instance. My, my my love for Vagrant only become only comes from understanding Chef. So otherwise, I might have actually probably used Orchard. Had I not yeah, already Vagrant, known Vagrant Chef. About those instructions, Vagrant is very vague with yeah, the instructions on, on their docs. I mean, it's, it took me like it took me a minute to really figure it out and really how to manipulate. And I went away from it because I, I hated them so much. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but so then I started using Core OS, and so I had to use them again. So the trick is, at the end of this, I'll, I'll share links with you all that have uh, both my slides and uh, a GitHub repository you can pull down and play with all the same code. I've documented all of the commands that I ran to actually do this because I'll tell you from first-hand experience all the people that I work with like it's very very vague and, and kind of hard to understand just by watching somebody else do it even watching me come up here and try and tell you all about it it's much better if you actually play with it create a couple images of your own start a couple containers you know mess around play with stuff so I've given uh, the I pushed the repository up so you can actually pull down kind of start with my my uh, Base, so that you don't have to fight paper and things like that. So as long as you have virtual box and variant already installed. There's also, oh, sorry, I was going to say Docker. Uh, they have a really good like interactive tutorial uh, on the web, so you can go through and play with that. Like when we first started digging into this at Square Math, I was like, what in the hell is going on? And that helped out quite Why a bit. Why did you use this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> DevOps user group is pretty heavily centered around Docker right now. That's awesome. Sounds like I need to start tying in all these other meetups. Yeah. It's, quite, it's quite the drive for me, though. You know. So, so Miles, it looks like you have a question. If your laptop were to be shut down, what's your? How do you get running in the morning? So if, if as I as a developer, not as a. So I never turn my laptop server. off. No. Good, right, yeah. <laughs> ever, ever. The answer is, is I never shut down anything. No, no. Right, so, so if 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 for some crazy reason someone were to turn my laptop off right now, I'd start crying. No, I. <laughs> what if you were to have a kernel panic on us and like you probably have every sixteen? That minutes. never happens ever. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so realistically, if 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 all hell breaks loose and my laptop turns off, or I, it's like nine months later, uh, you can <laughs> you can actually use uh, since I'm running inside of Vagrant, I do Vagrant up. And that would fire up my virtual machine that I'm using to uh, kind of host Docker. From there, all of my containers are still ready to go. So what I could actually do is say, so we'll go ahead and stop the existing containers and pretend like we just started up the VM. And this will be the, the existing state as it goes if it were to turn off after I've already done this or if we had a current panic or anything else. So I can check that nothing's running, and we see from Docker VS that nothing's happening. So I can actually do is since I've already built these containers, I've already started them, they already exist, I can literally just say start the Rails app, and actually we'll do it in the right order. Forgot to start. Yeah, there's that whole start thing, right? Okay, and that was it. Ready to go. That was it. That's all it took. The containers are running. If I curl localhost, or if I, uh, let's make sure it's the right port. So are you, like, then you write code, right? Are you sharing a directory with that, with your virtual machine or something? That is the so if this were a real Rails app and that was what I was doing, what I would do is I'd put this Docker file inside of my Rails repository, and I would share the entire existing directory that the Docker file existed in inside of the container so that any code I changed locally would automatically be reflected in the container. So I could develop against a container, which is pretty awesome if you think about it, because I can change my dependencies and start new containers without stopping the existing ones. So I could have five different versions, say I wanted to stress test it against five different versions of Ruby. I could start up five containers all based off of a couple of the different pieces changed, and all of them would share the same code, and I could edit them all at the same time. Cool. So, so as a developer, so let's say some DevOps guy prescribes to me, like, you're going to use Docker now because we need you to run this stuff on, which similar things happened before. Um, you first give him a high five. 
So basically what I'm, what I'm trying to poke at here is how much would my workflow have to, have to change as a developer? Like, is there an extra step? Like, can I still just make a change in my Ruby code and then go to localhost some port and see the change? Okay, Absolutely. So to, t to tell you the truth, to tell you exactly how it works, at least at SquareMouth, we've turned all of our external services outside of the Rails app itself into containers. So we run uh, Mongo server locally, Redis, MySQL. Um, I should tell you. you. You almost showed the production stuff last time. So yeah, no, we're going back into the whole production area. Right? Docker is just easy to share. It's like Git. It is. It's wonderful. So these are all of the containers that we fire up every day. Like my entire development cycle revolves around these containers. So I have a my, I have a data only container for MySQL to store off my data. I have uh, an actual MySQL container linked to that data container, memcache, Mongo, and Redis. And okay. now I don't have to actually manually install all these services on my laptop, which is awesome. Do you guys manage a lot of this stuff in the cloud, or is it just? So our, our actual infrastructure, since we don't push Docker out in production, because you're not supposed to, shame on you if you do. You should. <laughs> <laughs> you can, you can. I'm not advocating anything, but go ahead and do it. But uh, since all of our actual infrastructure is EC2, uh, we don't use Docker in production. We just use it to mirror our production environment at this point. So, but to answer his question, so like one scenario could be is that as a developer and as a DevOps guy, you already have a local cloud that the business is using. You push all of containers, development containers to that cloud, and as a developer, you come in in the morning, and you just pull down that container. It's got all your information in it. You upload it every day, and then to create, you know, seemingly some security, since you're not, you know, a true DevOps guy, to create security. <laughs> <laughs> it's all on my own machine. It's you guys can't get to it, even though there's no password. We're good. Yeah, to, to create some security, uh, there would be no footprint at the end of the day, because we would just destroy whatever you did and then it would just come back to you. So in the cloud, it's secure, but then on your local machine, it would be gone. It would be gone. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hopefully that wasn't all the questions. Anybody else? So, no, I have no questions. Go for it. Um, so here you ran CoreOS, right? Okay. You guys aren't running CoreOS in production. No, so were you no. running CoreOS here because CoreOS is kind of cool and wanted to kind of show that too? Or so the reason I chose CoreOS, it's very, it was a very specific conscientious choice on my part, is that uh, CoreOS is the absolute bare bones minimum it takes to run Docker. CoreOS doesn't come with a package manager like Ubuntu does, so you can't install packages into it. You can't run update to grab new packages. It, its sole purpose is to run Docker, systemd, and etcd, which are other portions of the whole kind of Docker family. I didn't cover those, but they're there. But essentially, CoreOS is designed specifically for running containers. So I, I think it's the, the right hammer for the job. Oh, OK. Yeah. I mean, they got moved to Docker, which is, it breaks like hourly. Um, I mean, you know. That yeah, so there is that. If you're, if you're a fan of homebrew, you can use, uh, uh, right, you can just homebrew install boot to Docker. But again, I, I personally wouldn't. Same, yeah, same reason he said. Okay. If 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 you're looking, yeah, yeah. If you're looking to start your infrastructure and you really want to use Docker locally, not to toot my own horn or anything, but I would personally start with the container that I, the Vagrant file that I've used for CoreOS, yeah. only simply because I stole it from the CoreOS people. They're very smart people. They work. They they've worked on stuff for Google and things like that. It's all from Google, so. I'm, I'm standing on the shoulders of the giants it's, here. It's the most stable environment to use Docker like natively on your Mac. Okay. You know, boot to Docker. They, so they got boot to Docker, which, which lets you get to this kind of pseudo native version of Docker on a Mac OS. But it, it's still running the VM. It's yeah. still it's still virtual machine yeah, and like yeah. some busy box and some other things yeah, like that. Yeah. Well, so, speaking of Docker, you run a VM, you run a Cola, you run a ECU. So yeah, exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. and, and, and again, you know, with OS, you can run it in EC. EC2 even has, you know, some some native yeah, you can some for Docker. Well, and the other nice thing is because all of these pieces are uh, built into the Lynx kernel, you can run Docker on a plain vanilla Ubuntu uh, machine. So if I fire up an EC2 node with Ubuntu 12.04 or higher, because that's the that comes with the default kernel high enough, uh, 
then you're good to go. You can just install Docker from your app get page, page manager and away you run with it. Internally in our office, we have a Ubuntu server that hosts uh, Docker containers and we use it for random services. Like right now, it's running a reverse proxy for a node application that we wrote. Why'd you do that? <laughs> to expose CI to the outside world. That, that was just node hate. Why you got hate on node? Oh, God. <laughs> Don't you just love rollbacks? That's another presentation. <laughs> <laughs> I really tried. I don't believe you. <laughs> you don't. You don't. Believe that. Yeah, I don't believe you. I did. I deluded. I. I convinced myself that I liked JavaScript for a while. <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> so, right. yeah. so, so the, the problem is that you started with JavaScript. You should have started with like coffee. Oh scripts. right. No, I mean, let's let's. Honestly, I am still listed as assistant organizer for IndieJS. That's uh, pretty legit. So, <laughs> kind of a big deal. You said you're kind of a big deal. Oh no, no. I mean, my point is like that's how that's how far I had gone down the like yeah, I like JavaScript route. <laughs> and then and, and, I finally admitted to myself that in truth I hate JavaScript <laughs> and I just wanted to like it. I guess I wanted. Sort of like, well, like you said, you're gonna drink a whole beer before a presentation so that you like wouldn't be nervous, right? So like, I wanted to pretend I like JavaScript so that I could write it and like enjoy writing it, and ultimately I eventually gave up. So you tried to like fake it until you made it, but yeah, it didn't work like, out. Yeah, basically. I even like recently had a, had a client try to write some copy script, and they were like, "Hey, we're gonna have to have a talk <laughs> <laughs> about the copy script that you put in here." And I'm like, "What? That's not that's not cool." They're like, well, I'll let it go this one time. <laughs> but DHH, like DHH says it's cool, right? So it must be good. Right, yes. <laughs> uh, incidentally, I heard someone the other day suggest potentially that he's like the Fox News of the Ruby community. <laughs> <laughs> and while I, I think that's unfair, there's enough. To Fox News. There's, wait, 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 wait. there's like Bill O'Reilly or something. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, all the names are going to say Fox News. It's like, you know, what is that? Is that Sean Hannity? Is that Larry Beck? Is that who it is? Is it like a combination of all of them? <laughs> So if I at all sparked your interests about Docker, you can always uh, hit me up on Twitter. I'm at Indozi Media. It's a really silly name, but whatever. Or you can check out my slides on Speaker Deck or my GitHub repository. Um, or you can email me, cstefan at squaremouth.com. I'll do a quick question. Yeah. Of those reports that were exposed, if I'm on like, your local network and I, and I know that you don't really say password, <laughs> can I like, probably you? So, so the, the trick to it is you can't. Part of the way I set up my Vagrant machine, which is why I don't have to worry about passwords, is that it's a private internal network. Oh, you're running through the through Vagrant. Okay. Right. So you can't get to it, right. which is why I don't care about passwords. Had okay. it been a real thing I was exposing for other people to like okay. look at, there would have been real passwords. So what was happening there is a Linux container was exposing 3306. Vagrant was ex was essentially rerouting 49.129 to 3306 in that Linux container. And exposing 49139 to your to OS 10, right? Yes, absolutely. Right. Just want to make sure I'm following the the so, path so the, there's of lots of layers systems and yeah. containers correctly. Layers is the word I'd use. Yes. All over the place. Layers everywhere. Yeah. It's kind of like the yeah. internet. It's a series of tubes. <laughs> <laughs> Not like a truck. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>